Amen? Amen. Well, good morning, everybody. My name is John, I'm one of the pastors here, and I look forward to teaching the Word of God this morning. We're going to be in 1 Peter chapter 2 as we continue in our, our series. I had a buddy years ago that was selling his truck, and I asked him why. He said, I'm tired of helping people move. So are you serious? He's like, yeah, I hate it. Everyone knows I have a truck. Get called every weekend. I can't say no, so the truck's got to go. And when we think of all, like, the list of different things that are, like, good tasks, things we do because we're good people, moving's got to be right there at the top of the list. Um, helping people move. Maybe you've been in a situation where you show up and they hadn't packed anything yet, and you got to figure those things out. Now, there's always one thing that's really difficult. It's how do you move the couch, especially if there's stairs involved. I mean, the couches, they're always heavy and big. And I remember this one time, a buddy and I, we were moving this huge hide-a-bed type couch. And there was a staircase involved, and other people were watching us, not helping. And we were coming down, and the couch was too big for the staircase. And so we're going through and we full on, we get stuck. We're there, we're trying to move it, we're trying to hold it, this thing's heavy. And, and people are telling us like, just lift it over the banister. And the, the frame, the metal frame underneath is like digging into my fingers and it, it hurts so bad. And all I can hear in the back of my mind is Ross from Friends going, pivot, pivot, pivot. And I'm thinking, shut up, shut up, shut up, right, as we're, as we're going through that. And I just want to be done. I want to let go. I, I, this is hurt so bad. The, and I'm usually like on the downside where the momentum's going, so all the weight's on me. And I just want to be done. I want to let go. But doing so would cause more damage. It would bust up the wall. It would break the rail. It would hurt the couch. All those different things. And I want to do good. That's why I'm helping move. I want to do good. All these people are looking at me and seeing the good I'm trying to do. And they think it's wrong and telling me. And it's a big, big mess. Today's subject, unfortunately, can be a big, big mess for a lot of people with different circumstances that they're going through. And our topic today, it's an S word. Not that S word. A different S word. It's on submission which many people put on the same level as the four-letter variety. But as we're talking about that word today, which is thematic in this whole series, we just want to let go and not deal with it. But in doing so, we would cause more damage. And we are here for, for the good of it. And the word submit, it's actually a good word that we're going to get to unpack just a little bit more today. So we're in this series called Roll Call. We're in First Peter, um, going through a couple verses at time and looking at different relationships uh, that we have this opportunity, this good opportunity to submit governing authorities last week. Uh, we have this week and, and then a couple more weeks to go as well. And um, again, the whole point of this series is knowing where to yield so we don't collide. And there's so many different opportunities to crash in life. And so yielding is so important. From time to time, when I'm taking off and leaving the home, I'll say to, to my wife, hey, I'm heading out. And she'll respond, drive safe. And I'm kind of thinking, I know, I, yeah, drive safe, all that kind of stuff. And then she'll say, hey, you know, you drive safe. It's not you I'm worried about. It's all those other crazy drivers I'm worried about. And if you were here last week, you learned that that crazy driver was Pastor Scott that she's worried about. <laughs> okay, so like we, we want to be like not colliding. Like we need like submission. It's a good, such a good thing. And I want that to get into our minds and our hearts this morning that submitting is good. Very, very good. So here we are in 1 Peter 2, 18. Peter's the author of this letter, one of Jesus' disciples, part of the inner three, uh, a leader in the church of Jerusalem. Later on in life, he takes his ministry outside of the borders of Israel into the Roman Empire. And this letter was written decades into that endeavor as he wrote this letter to churches in Asia Minor, present-day Turkey, who were going through a terribly hard time. Nero is the emperor. He's a, a vicious dictator who can murder whoever he wants with with no one calling his bluff. And it was a dark time for the church and they need hope 
to persevere and to keep going in Jesus. And that is why this letter was written to give them and us hope, a future hope that we have in Jesus. So verse 18, servants, be subject to your masters with all respect, not only to the good and gentle, but also to the unjust. So as we talk about uh, to subject ourselves and to submit, I want you to know that we, we hear your stories of pain that comes with this word. And far too many of you have been domineered, lied to, manipulated to comply. And this word has a lot of baggage for you. And I want to just encourage you to give this a chance to open up your heart that this word could mean something entirely different, that this word is good It brings glory to God. It's a good thing. Submission, what does submission mean? Submission literally is uh, to place yourself under and then to arrange or put in order. So a, a good definition that I like about what submission is, is submission is to properly arrange yourself under an authority. Now that word originally came from a military term Like imagine soldiers ready to be deployed for battle, ready at the command of their leader to go out and to fight and to accomplish the mission. Everyone knows their roles, knowing their tasks at the mission at hand, and they are ready to go and fulfill that mission. There are several myths that get tied into this word that we just just need to bust. The first is that submission is for weak people. You're gonna be strong, you're gonna do what you want, when you want, how you want, and that, then if you're submitting, you're not that, but submission takes strength, it's not for the weak. The other one is that submission is to be silent. You know, like know your role, shut your mouth, put a big thing of duct tape over it and don't talk, don't say anything, submission is silence. That's not what submission is at all. And then the third is um, submission is unquestioned obedience. And it doesn't matter if you're asked to do something evil or bad or whatever. You just got to obey the authority and do whatever they say. And that is not the picture of submission as well. Submission is not meant to be for suppression. Submission is for you to know your role, what God has called you to do, and to do that with excellence, to add value to the mission, to enhance the likelihood of success. That's submission. It's a beautiful thing. The picture of submission is a soldier ready to do whatever it takes to accomplish the mission. And it takes strength. It takes courage. And it takes upholding the truth. The other thing about submission is submission is actually freeing. So many times the word of God twists, or not twists, but takes things and turns them upside down of what we would expect. And the word of God does that here. What would seem would be restrictive and controlling is actually life-giving and freeing. The verse we interacted with last week that we're going to bring up again, verse 16, which plays in all of this context of what we're going here, says this, live as people who are free, not using your freedom as a cover up for evil, but living as servants of God. That's what we're called to do, to submit to God, to live as his servants by his divine design. Submission. It's freeing, and it starts with following God, the most freeing thing we can do on the planet because God is always out in front of us. Like he's always leading the way. So much of this comes down to who goes first. And yeah, it's nice to be first in line for ice cream, but would it be nice to be first to storm the beaches of Normandy? Like the, the, this concept, submission, who goes first, we come and we recognize that God always goes first. He's out in front of us. He's leading the way, and he led the way to our salvation by sending his one and only son, born of a virgin, proving that he was God, who is fully God and fully man, who came to this earth and died on a terrible, gruesome death on a cross in your place for your sins, and he was buried and he rose again so that in trust in him, you might have life. 2 Corinthians 5.21 says it so well that God made him sin who knew no sin 
so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. And it is through trust in him that we experience true and absolute freedom so that we can follow him and be free. So as we're still here looking at verse 18, we have a couple tension points. We got servants, which we kind of use to soften that a little bit, but the word um, there is slave. There's no getting around it. And that brings all sorts of emotion and memories and lots of questions when you start talking about slaves and, and masters. So that's, that's something there. And then you keep reading and it's like these masters, you're supposed to give them all respect, like every ounce of your respect, all of it is supposed to go to this master. And then you keep reading and it's like, oh man, like it doesn't matter if they are good or bad, right or wrong, just or unjust, you're still supposed to treat them the same. And it's like, how do we deal with that? How do we work through it? Now the word for unjust there, that's used in verse 18, this word means crooked, not straight, corrupt, harsh. And uh, we have some picture here, like an x-ray of a bone. You know, like, is that how a bone is supposed to look? No, right? And there's another picture there. I mean, man, I would love to hear the story of how, ugh, no. that's No, we're not gonna hear the story of that. I have no idea how that happened, but the, you know that that's not right. Like those bones are supposed to be straight. And when we're talking about unjust, crooked people, we realize that their lives are completely broken. And maybe, just maybe, there can be a little bit of compassion in us of what they're going through because they are broken people that we keep in mind. So we have these unjust masters and, and we're still supposed to, to subject and show respect to them. And as we continue to wade through this, the, the text is not clear here because that's not the point of First Peter is trying to make. He's trying to help slaves or servants know how to live in, in their situation. There are other places in scripture where it is so clear that slavery is wrong. Okay, and unfortunately this verse has been used at different times in past history um, to condone something that the Bible condemns. And slavery is absolutely wrong. Uh, a couple of verses that we'll throw up there. First Peter 1, 9, there's this list of um, like kind of A1 sins, I would describe them. And right there, uh, underlined in First Timothy is enslavers. And so clearly there's this, um, this notion that slavery is so wrong. And then in the Old Testament, in Exodus 21, 16, whoever steals and sells a, a man is worthy of capital punishment. So um, the Bible is crystal clear that slavery is wrong. With that, we also need to keep in mind that the situation that was happening in the Roman Empire is much different than what comes to our mind with our American history, our American nightmare, the African slave trade and how horrible that was. Those are different things in different situations. In the Roman Empire, people would sometimes like sell themselves into slavery to pay off a debt. And um, they had different opportunities and it, it was just a completely different thing. It wasn't racially motivated, it was economically driven. Uh, but with that said, slavery was still harsh. It was still terrible. Slaves had no rights, they didn't have a voice, they didn't have as many opportunities and they were treated poorly. They were beaten, they were brutalized, they were dehumanized. And it was a very, very harsh situation that they experienced. So what do we do about that today? Because here's where we at, we're at and find ourselves in. We're in this context where the slaves that Peter's talking about, it is a softer, type experience than what comes to our mind with the new world trade system. It's softer than that. And what they were experiencing is likely harsher than what you and I experience in the labor force. So we have to then take these principles and then apply them into our context. It is appropriate to apply this verse in our lives to how we deal with our bosses, with our supervisors, 
with our board members, with these people in our working relationships, volunteer coordinators, the list goes on and on, that we interact with and work with and then get to submit to, the principles still apply. What an important topic. Think of all the time we spend working and volunteering. On average, that's 90,000 hours per person. So knowing how to work through these situations is vital. So let's work through them. Let's turn to verse 19. Peter goes on to say this, for this is a gracious thing. When mindful of God, one endures sorrow while suffering unjustly. For what credit is it when you sin and you are beaten for it, you endure. But if when you do good and suffer for it, you endure. This is a gracious thing in the sight of God. A couple things here in these verses. First, like the capstone point Peter is making is do good. That's the ultimate. To do good, to keep doing good. That's what Peter is driving home here. Now, what was happening in this context is Peter's addressing the slaves. I mean, you, can, you can see it playing out. Non-Christian slave with a master. Slave becomes a Christian. Life completely transformed, set free by the power and blood of Jesus. A new creation. The old is gone, the new has come. An incredible experience. Their life has changed. Earthly master is like, what the heck is going on here? Like, this slave I had is completely different. And then you can imagine, with no context for this master, their slave is starting to do these things that seem weird and bizarre. And they become suspicious. I mean, imagine with no context hearing a slave talking about taking the Lord's Supper and communion. Like, this is cup is blood and bread is body and they're eating it. Like, and there's a lot of suspicion that there was cannibalism happening in the early church. And then the early church would do these things called love feasts. So this time of fellowship and communion and celebration and people around are hearing this and they're like, what is these Christians doing? Are they having these wild orgy parties and those kind of things? And the, the masters were becoming suspicious of their slaves. And you know human nature, what you don't understand, you're cruel to. And so they increased their beatings of the slaves. And so we must realize the slaves... Most of them, they're doing good things. They're worshiping God. They're following the ways of Jesus. And in doing so, sorrow and suffering is coming to them. And oftentimes when we experience tough times and pain and suffering, we wonder what we did wrong and how could this be and why is this going on? And the reason why it's going on is because you are doing everything right. And that was the situation for them. Man, it's tough. Any sort of pain, any sort of sorrow, any sort of suffering is hard and it's bad news. And what do you do in those moments? So doing good can bring sorrow and suffering. But what do you do there? You keep doing good. Pain is not a license to then do what you want. Verse 20 gives... Or, sorry, verse, yeah, verse 19 and 20 gives kind of like an example. You can kind of look at it. It says, like, what credit is there if you sin against this master and then you're beaten for it and you then endure? And the answer is there's no credit. Like, that is the bed you made. Uh, so if you're late to work and you're not doing your job well and you get fired, that's not this sorrow to endure. It's, man, this... This happened, and take responsibility for that. But then he goes on and says, is what is the credit here? What is the amazing thing is if you keep doing good, even when you're suffering for that good. You keep doing good even when good is viewed as bad. And that is what was happening there. So in our situations, in our volunteer work, in our work, in our jobs, in how we spend our time as retired people, 
We keep doing good. We keep upholding. And that word endure that's in that verse, it means to stay underneath something that is heavy. A terrible hide to bed couch that's hurting all your fingers. You, you stay under there and you keep holding it and you keep doing it. You keep doing good even when good is seen as bad. And many of you are facing opportunities to do this where you're suffering and, and having hardship because of a boss who's a jerk, a supervisor who doesn't understand, someone who's incompetent at what they do. You shouldn't even be in that position in the first place. What do you do in those situations? You keep doing good. When your territory and your sales goals gets doubled after a record year and there's no way to make it happen because your team has been shrunk, you keep doing good. When you're purposefully given a bad review so you don't give a bonus, you keep doing good. When you're required to teach or train on topics that contradict the word of God, you keep doing good. When you're told to withhold information from parents that is vital to, to, vital to help their students work through mental health issues, you keep doing good because doing good is the ultimate aim. You keep doing good according to what God has defined as good, and that is our highest priority. Do good, even when good is seen as bad. But who do we do all this for? Who do we do the, all this for? Let's, let's take a journey kind of back a few verses, and we, we talked about this a couple weeks ago. Look, let's look at verse 13 real quick. Be subject for the Lord's sake to every human institution. So yeah, we're called to submit, to properly arrange yourself in order under authority. We are called to do that for whose sake? For the Lord's sake. Leads us to our second point. Doing good is for the Lord's sake. So it can be helpful here in verse 18, as we're reading where it says, servants be subject to your masters, we can add in, it still applies back from verse 13, for the Lord's sake. It's not for the master. It's not for the board. It's not for the boss. It's not for the president of the parent club. It's for the Lord. People's agendas, threats, or power, they do not have the final say in your life. The Lord is the ultimate master with ultimate power and authority. So do good for the Lord's sake. Our third point here is if we continue on verse 20, that this word is used twice. It says here, saying, last part of the verse, talking about when you suffer for doing good and you endure, you keep holding, you keep hanging on, you keep that heavy thing under you and you keep moving forward. It says the very last words, this is a gracious thing in the sight of God. So we learn that doing good, even when good is viewed as bad, is a beautiful thing in the Lord's sight. It's a beautiful thing. Now, grace, grace, many of you are familiar with this term and you've heard it before. Grace is like undeserved favor. Grace is a free gift that you don't deserve. Grace is our salvation. It's how we are able to interact and relate to a living, loving God. Grace is amazing and grace is the most beautiful thing. It is the most beautiful thing that could ever be expressed. Grace is beauty. And so it is a beautiful thing. When you continue to do good when everything in you wants to stop, when you continue to do what's right when you're mistreated and you're suffering and you are in deep anguish, it is a beautiful thing to God when you do good in those situations. So how do we do all this? Because it's really hard. 
There's nothing in you that wants to keep going. Verse 19 tells us how to do this. It says, repeating this and reviewing this, when mindful of God, one endures sorrow while suffering unjustly. That's the key. That's the ticket. When mindful of God. This word is talking about our conscious. An awareness, an awareness of God where God is not just on your mind, but he is in your mind. And how do you know that this is where you are supposed to be? Is that when you aren't thinking about anything, your mind brings up these things to your conscious. When you're not thinking, you think of God. When you're not intentionally working on a project or a problem or an interaction with a person, you're thinking of God. Here's the thing. When there is hurt that has been done to you, especially when there can be a face to that hurt, especially when it's in situations where someone's been unjust to you, where you're doing everything right, you're doing your best, you're dialed in, you're rocking it, and yet someone is still harsh and unjust to you. If you're anything like me, you'll become fixated on that person. I mean, it's just like they somehow take over. Like, they're in your head, they're in your mind, and you become so obsessed with that person that they're all you think about. And there's different levels of this. And if this, is, if this is something that you haven't experienced or aren't experiencing now, be proactive that this doesn't happen. Like focus on Philippians 4, 8 and set your mind on things of God, whatever is lovely and pure and honorable and worthy of praise. Think about those things and be fixated on that stuff to be proactive so that this doesn't happen to you. Because it, be, it can be rough. It can be out of control. Like when you're at a grocery store and you see that it's someone with the same hair color as that person and you immediately think, oh, it's him or her. And your heart starts beating and you start breathing heavily and those kind of things. Or you're looking at the sky on a summer day and the beautiful white fluffy clouds with your kids and they're seeing dinosaurs and unicorns and all you can see is that person's face. Man, like it can get to that level. And this toxic, unjust person is renting space in your mind for free. And it's time to evict them. And the only way you're going to be able to evict them is to replace them with being mindful of God. Out with the person, in with God. And it starts with repentance, saying you're sorry asking for forgiveness for making a person so much more important than God himself, and then experiencing the grace and the forgiveness that can come with that. And then in some cases, we, you might need to interact with that person, maybe not even talking about the hurt or the un, unjust thing that took place, but just to be in the same sphere as them to realize they're not like this crazy monster that you created in your mind. But what is imminent is that with our repentance and our confession, we continue to spend time in God's word. And this is nothing new. You hear this, this from up here in your life groups in different places all the time, spending time in God's word. So find a Bible reading plan that works for you, that helps, and make it a part of your daily practice to delight in his word because it's a get to and fall in love with scripture. And many of you have that habit. Amazing, great job, keep it up. Something that I've been thinking about and want to do is try to bring up these verses more often in my mind instead of just when I read it. Whether it's a list on my phone of verses to look at throughout the day or to write some thoughts on it or have a discussion, and uh, I was very intentional with the word. Uh, th I've thought about it because I haven't implemented this yet. I want to grow in that and work on that. And that could be a challenge where you're at, where you read God's word, but take that next step where you're recalling it throughout your day on a regular basis. 
you can do it. But the key to enduring, to keep holding up what is heavy, is to be mindful of God. Remember, doing good, even when good is viewed as bad, it's a beautiful thing. And many of you have suffered, are suffering, or will suffer. And in those moments when you're just trying to hang on and endure and to keep going, remember that you are not alone. I think that's one of the hardest things that comes with suffering is you don't know how to like talk about it and you don't know who to say what to or you might get in trouble or you might put someone down. So then you just don't even say anything and you feel utterly alone. No one knows what's happening with your kids. No one knows what's happening in your marriage. No one is happening at work and you don't even know how to talk about it or even if you should talk about it. God knows and God sees and God sees the good that you are trying to do. And when he sees you doing good, even when good is viewed as bad, he sees a beautiful thing in what you're doing. He sees it. You are on display. You're a picture in his gallery. You are God's starry night, his Sistine Chapel, and his Mona Lisa. And he is profoundly impacted and blessed by your obedience. So in the midst of your sorrow, keep doing good. Keep enduring. Keep submitting to Lord as your master. And keep doing good, even when good is viewed as bad. Join me in prayer. Lord, we, we submit to you and your ways. And Lord, I pray that you would give us the, the delicate tender touch to know how to navigate challenging situations of how to honor you when honoring you doesn't look so clear. Lord, I pray that you would encourage us, people of Morningstar, Lord, those here who struggle to submit. Ah, man, uh, that's me. Lord, I pray that you would change our mind about what submission is and that we would realize that it is good and freeing and glorious under your design and that we would seek to be mindful of you in everything that we do and in every way. And Lord, in those times where we are being treated harshly by the good we're trying to do. I pray that you give us endurance, give us courage to keep going, knowing that the only way that's possible is being fixated on you. Lord, we repent of making people too big of a deal. You're the deal, you're the big deal. You and you alone are worthy of praise. Your greatness is unsearchable. So we love you today in your name. Amen.